Minister uh, Katevari Rua uh, Amoti, who is the acting chairperson of the Uganda Human Rights Commission. And uh, to my extreme left, we have uh, Mr. Uh, Bionabie uh, Kamadi, who is the director of uh, research and education at, uh, and documentation at uh, the Uganda Human Rights Commission. Gentlemen, many thanks for making time to speak to us. Thank you very much. Uh, let's start with, the, I think, the beginning. Um, uh, with you, uh, Doctor. Uh, how essential is it for us to appreciate uh, human rights uh, in developing countries such as Uganda uh, uh, when it comes to an electoral process? Well, first of all, before <coughs> I discuss that, I would like to, with your permission, to congratulate uh, His Excellency, the President of Uganda, and the entire government of Uganda, and uh, indeed the people of Uganda for the successful journey you have, we have traveled to reach to this day when we are celebrating uh, the 58th anniversary of our independence. I would immediately want to request everybody in this country to realize the importance of this particular celebration of the 58th anniversary because it is taking place at the time when we are in the midst of the general elections. This celebration should remind us of the journey we undertook when we got independence in 1962. It's not yet complete. We must consolidate what we have achieved, but we must accomplish what we haven't yet achieved. To come to your question, uh, why is it uh, human rights so important uh, in uh, our societies? Oh. Uh, and I will discuss that also and connect it to the current uh, process of elections. It's very important that uh, uh, we realize that uh, human rights, uh, or every human being is born with, hum uh, with human rights. And, there are f and the human rights are not given to any individual by anybody, not even the government. Uh, they are inherent in our lives when we were born with them. And therefore, we are, wherever we are, they must be respected if we are to live as human beings in dignity. So whether we are Africans or uh, the uh, other people who are in Asia or in Europe or whoever, it's very important to observe and protect human rights because this is what determines the dignity of a human being. Oh. So in the African countries and particularly in Uganda to come back home, human rights is observance and protection and promotion of human rights is very important and because if we are to live in dignity, and if we are to also achieve the goals of our independence, which we are celebrating today, it's very important to protect, to promote, and observe human rights. And now we are in the process of elections. It's very important that the electoral process throughout, whatever is done, is done in the line with the spirit of protection and promotion of human rights. Mm. That is only when the elections will be successful and have meaning. Uh, let me bring you in, uh, Mr. Kamadi, because uh, we are uh, uh, going to have an election in uh, an unprecedented, uh, with an unprecedented uh, pandemic of, of, of our generation, arguably also for the past 100 years. And I think the first question before we delved into the uh, human rights vis-a-vis -vis elections uh, should have actually been appreciating what human rights are and segueing that into the pandemic and some of the SOPs and some of the uh, new standard procedures that have been put forth. Uh, give me uh, an appreciation of where we find ourselves in what, on one side, trying to make sure that uh, uh, the virus is, that well, we observe what the Ministry of Health says, and on the other side, not demeaning the human rights as they stand. Uh, how do we appreciate those two? Thank you very much. Um, 
human rights is a cross-cutting issue. Mm. Actually, when you say before we even delve into human rights, we should have talked about uh, the pandemic. The pandemic itself is a human rights issue. So you cannot disassociate COVID-19 from human rights. They are inseparable. Mm. Because actually COVID-19 affects the whole spectrum of human rights. We should not be focusing on the right to health. The lockdown until recently was total. And uh, up to now, some sections are yet to be uh, late mm. to operate. Mm. Therefore, the pandemic has affected political, economic, social, cultural, and every aspect of our lives. Now, specifically when it comes to the human rights and elections, I think the most important thing that uh, we should appreciate as a country is, um, is that uh, human rights should be respected through the electro throughout the electoral process but all actors should be quick to appreciate that not all human rights are absolute oh. the right to vote provided for under article 59 of the constitution is not an absolute right in our constitution much as it is very very important we have article 23 of the constitution that provides for the right to personal liberty. If, if, if I could just pause you there, uh, what would you define as absolute for uh, someone who is not uh, very cognizant of uh, uh, legal uh, jargon? Okay, uh, absolute rights are stipulated under Article 44 of the Constitution mm. and they include freedom from torture. Now that means that one that right must be enjoyed at all times and very critical in the electoral processes we are talking about as we shall be discussing later uh, freedom from torture cruel in human or degrading treatment or punishment it's a mouthful but most importantly we usually not torture but there is also inhuman and degrading treatment we have the right to a fair hearing is one of the absolute rights under Article 44 of the Constitution, oh. freedom from slavery and servitude, and also the right to an order of habeas corpus, producing somebody in court dead or alive in case of where we have incommunicado detention and you do not know where one's relative is. So those are the absolute rights. But in the context of the elections, therefore in our constitution, it is only those rights provided for under Article 44 that are absolute in nature. Now, all other rights can be limited and the limitations are provided for under Article 43 oh. for purposes of public order, public health, public security, public morality. And in this case, in the context of the pandemic, it is for purposes of public health. So in order to en enjoy Article 59, right to vote, and maybe Article 1, uh, exercising the uh, the people exercising their will on who should govern them through regular free and fair elections it should also be read together with article 38 where every individual is free to participate in the affairs of government either individually or through his or her representatives so all actors in the political process should appreciate that the right to vote should be looked at in line with other constitutional provisions under Article 23 and the most important Article 43 and cooperate with the Electoral Commission, Uganda Human Rights Commission and other actors generally, Minister of Health, to ensure that in exercising the right to vote, we should not uh, prejudice other rights as it is stipulated under Article 43 of our Constitution. But I think also mm. what is important to stress here in terms of relating uh, human rights and the current situation of COVID-19 mm. is that really COVID-19 is affecting a very important right that is the right to life. So it's very important in whatever we do, whatever we, we, we aspire to achieve in terms of enjoying our own rights, it's very important that we know that uh, this menace of COVID-19 
is affecting a very important right, that is the right to life. And therefore we must cooperate, as Kamad has said, we must cooperate with the Ministry of Health, we must cooperate with the, uh, the police, we must cooperate with all the security agencies, we must respect and follow the directives from the President, the guidelines from the Ministry of Health, so that as we enjoy other rights, including the rights we should enjoy during the elections, we know a very important right is being affected by COVID-19. It's, uh, it's, it's very, I, I want us to move on to the uh, election uh, uh, process and uh, human rights, uh, that, that, that very, very important, uh, well, the primary focus of this particular discussion. But you're, you're raising some very interesting points. And uh, as someone who's not uh, a legal scholar myself, uh, it, you're very uh, drawn back when you hear there were reports uh, in Southern Africa uh, very recently during the lockdown uh, of uh, some legal pr practitioners actually uh, uh, dragging the governments to court over the lockdowns. Now, it, it leaves... Uh, uh, a very, very wanting picture, uh, given the fact that, well, the government is on one hand uh, trying to make sure that uh, the virus doesn't uh, blow up out of control, and on the other hand, uh, someone has a legal premise that is, uh, you're taking away our right to uh, maybe association and, and all that, uh, which, uh, f for me, maybe, Kamadi, you could touch this very, very briefly before we get back to the elections. Uh, where does the, the, the human rights bodies, uh, let's say the human rights commissions of sorts, uh, where do you then draw the line? Because it, it's, it's very gray here. It, it's not gray if uh, everybody cared to appreciate and act objectively. Hmm. In the enjoyment of human rights, human rights are enjoyed in tandem with the duties and responsibilities. You can never say I have the right, a right to anything, and therefore you do, there is no corresponding duty or responsibility. <laughs> I followed the proceedings you are talking about. I think uh, for us here as a country, uh, uh, I should say, it is important to appreciate that in the enjoyment of human rights, mm. we must always uh, observe our duties and responsibilities as well. So there is no gray area. Like I've just told you, Article 23 provides for the right to personal liberty, but it also provides for when this right can be limited, you know? Uh, and one of the provisions is, is to prevent the spread of an in infectious disease. That's specifically? Y yes, yeah. specifically under Article 23, to, spray, uh, to prevent the spread of uh, an infectious disease. And uh, the, the, this is COVID we are talking about. So you cannot say, I have my freedom of movement. If uh, Muru and Elegu is under lockdown, you are... Uh, are required under Article 23 not to go there. And like I said earlier on, the limitations must be, uh, uh, must be uh, acceptable in a free and democratic society and, uh, uh, and demonstra demonstrably justifiable. Therefore, you cannot say I have the right to, 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 to freedom of movement, I will go there at all costs. You have a duty to protect others. Actual under Article 17 of our Constitution, where your rights begin is where other people's, where your rights stop yeah. is where other people's rights begin. It is a duty of every citizen in Uganda to respect the rights of others. So for you, if you say, I have my right, uh, uh, freedom of movement. The other peoples have the right to health. They have the right not to catch to, to catch the virus mm. from you. Right. So we must understand human rights and put it in perspective. F it, but, uh, but the issue of uh, you, you referred to South Africa. Mm. I was listening to the BBC this morning actually, and uh, they said something like Africa has done very well in terms of limiting the impact of COVID-19. Yes. Hmm? Yeah. That is now a fact. Sure. The, the, the danger we are, we are facing is our economies are likely to be affected. That's what they added. But th this achievement Af Africa has done, in spite of the challenges we have as a continent, we are not 
we are not well off like other continents in Europe, in, uh, in North America, and so on. But to do so well like that, one of the of, of, of the reasons why we have achieved that is that our governments generally, and our government here in Uganda, took steps. Some of them drastic to drastic to ensure that the spread of COVID-19 was minimized. And so the, lock the lockdowns had a good meaning for, for our people. That's why we have it's achieved It's justifiable. This. It's justifiable. Mm. Uh, you know, you, you, people should open their eyes and keep their ears open. Facts are on the ground. We know what is happening in Europe, what is happening in North America, what is happening in South America, in Brazil, and so on. We know what is happening there. You, you hear people talking of, I have my right not to put on a mask. Why do you tell me put on a mask? Surely, eh, if you are going to endanger other people's rights, and it is in, the, in your interest, your interest of your family, oh. your wife, your children, and so on, that you put on a mask. But for you, you are interested only in your right. This is failing on the duties and responsibilities, which our countries, I think, have done well to emphasize through the measures they have taken. Okay, uh, let, let's move on. Um, uh, uh, what actually constitutes a free and fair election? I bring this up because uh, we were notified well in the wake of uh, the lockdowns and of course COVID-19 that uh, we'd be having um, uh, scientific campaigns. Now, this initially was mistaken by even the media. Uh, you would hear so many people saying uh, scientific elections, which was categorically wrong, uh, but scientific uh, campaigns. Now, how has the Human Rights Commission appreciated this? Do you get the sense that the scientific campaigns have been observed? Uh, and also, do, does a scientific campaign leading up to an election uh, defeat the whole rationale of uh, the broad spectrum of rights that uh, you and I are entitled to to start with. Uh, let me start with you, uh, the Doctor, then I'll, I'll hand it over to uh, uh, Mr. Kamadi. Well, uh, we have already talked about the need for us to appreciate the context in which we are operating, COVID-19. And at the same time, we have to follow the Constitution and that's why we are having the scientific, the hybrid scientific election. Um, well, they are very, they are, imp they are important rights which are being observed. There are others which are being affected to some extent by the, uh, um, the measures that have been taken to, in order to minimize the spread of COVID-19. But on the whole, so far, what has happened is encouraging. For example, one of the, of the rights that should be observed during a, a process of election like this is the right to associate. People should be free to associate either under political parties or associations or organizations. We have the political parties functioning in some cases with some difficulties, some of those difficulties actually emanating from the organizational problems that are within those political parties. But on the whole, the political parties, the political organizations are functioning. As we are talking now, we are coming to the end of the party primaries. And uh, uh, in spite of some of the problems we have witnessed recently, particularly during the NRM primaries, but at least uh, generally uh, people have been able to associate, to associate themselves under those organizations. It is very important in an election for people who qualify to vote people of, 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 the, of the age of 18 or above to, f to, to be allowed space to register and vote. I think the electoral process, uh, the electoral commission has done a good job in terms of uh, uh, registration of, of, of voters, uh, cross-checking the, the registers of the voters, that process also has generally gone on well. 
Um, it's, it's, it's important also that um, we ha the voters have access to information that can enable them to know what to do during the process of elections, to know the laws that govern, to govern the process of election. That is where we still have some challenges. We come in as a Human Rights Commission because that's where we make some contrib contribution in terms of two processes mainly, I think, and Kamadu will talk about this. We are in charge of the process of civic education in this country, which really, uh, in to, to some, some degree, overlaps with what also the Electoral Commission done, voter education. Now, we do, we, when we don't have enough resources, our hands are tied, we, we, are, not, we are not able to do enough civic education. Uh, and uh, certainly we have, we, we, have, we have done a lot, but we would have wished to do more. <laughs> The other process is uh, educating the population about the constitution of Uganda to know what their obligations are in terms of the constitution, including what Kamada has talked about, the, the right to vote, and how is this achieved. Again, that is an area where we come in and we intervene, and we've done a lot through our, our regional offices and field offices, but resources also limit us. But generally, you, you've, you've seen the enthusiasm that was witnessed during the NRM party primaries, in spite of the challenges that were there. But certainly, the mass turn up of the people during those elections is an indication that people are at a, a reasonable level of awareness hmm. eh, of their rights in terms of democracy, in terms of elections, and their obligations. We need now to deal with the challenges, but nevertheless, the level of awareness is, is promising. Uh, Kamadi, uh, I want to throw over to you, and uh, I, I mean, uh, the, the doctor has touched on many of the points. Uh, just touch on that, then maybe uh, th there was an issue where some opposition parties, well, with the scientific campaigns, some opposition parties uh, brought to light that uh, uh, some of the, the media uh, outlets are state-owned, and, uh, well, the others that are private are actually uh, uh, falling onto the other side, which is, uh, uh, well, to the ruling party, the the, the, the uh, appropriators. Um, what has been your view vis-a-vis uh, -vis constitution of a free and fair election? Uh, just uh, touch on that. Thank you very much. A free and fair election should reflect the will of the people. That is the most important thing. And uh, it should be transparent, all-inclusive, there is a free expression. Say that when someone is defeated, he or she accepts and say, yes, the ground was leveled, I was defeated. Now, the moment the tenets of uh, free will are not there, then there is a problem. It ceases to be free and fair. Implying whoever is participating in this election should be given enough space equal space say that the outcome is not contested on account of I was sidelined, I was disadvantaged. You've touched on the aspect of accessing media. The law as it is now provides for equal access to state media. Come yeah. on, if, if I could just... Let, uh, let me, uh, uh, let me a, finalize this. There was a gentleman, you've touched on something that's very fascinating. There was a gentleman who was apparently locked out of uh, uh, contesting for the top job in uh, one of the, uh, uh, the parties. I don't know what you make of that. Uh, does, would that actually... Uh, these are, of, of course, reports uh, during one of the primaries. He wanted to run for the presidency, and he was locked out, apparently. That's what he says. He's on record saying that. It, that would certainly affect what we call a free and fair elections. Mm. And what I should also point out, under Article 71 of the Constitution, it provides for multipartism. Mm. But one of the provi uh, sub uh, provisions there is to the effect that in the I I political parties should 
uh, exhibit a internal democracy in line with the democratic principles enshrined in the constitution. So whether you are NOOP, you are NRM, you are FDC, whatever you do within your internal political party activities should be, should, in, line. Should in, be in line with the democratic principles enshrined in the constitution. Mm. So at no point should any candidate be disadvantaged, whether it is an internal political party election mm. or a general election. So going back to a free and fair election, uh, the aspect of the media you touched on, mm. the provisions right now are talk of equal access to state-owned media. Right. Now, if any TV is not state-owned media, what should happen? Mm. Now, this is where we are calling upon all the actors, uh, a, the, the, the owners of the media, and we, have, we are reaching out to the National Association of Broadcasters, as Uganda Human Rights Commission, the Media Council, Uganda Communications Commission, Electoral Commission. It requires a st stakeholders' engagement and ensure that even if you own a media house privately, you should not disadvantage the others mm. in as far as campaigning is concerned. Because when you do that, if, if you block your opponent from campaigning on your radio, the outcome will be contested. It will, you, it, will, it will have legitimacy issues. So a free and fair election requires that you don't allow room for people to say, had he allowed him to appear on that talk show, mm. possibly he would have won. Actually, when that <coughs> is done, it also brings about what we call sympathy votes. It has happened. And uh, you see, uh, 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 you, you make arrangements, you, be, the, you beat up your co contender, and then people say, L we shall vote the other one. Now, that is not issue-based. So, uh, transparency, inclusiveness, uh, all help in ensuring that the election is credible and the, f the uh, free will of the people comes out of that election. Actually, now yeah. that issue is very important during this hybrid mm. scientific election, where candidates are not going to have access to the electorate as Physical it used access. to be, mm. yes, mm. you know. So really, we are, I'm adding my voice to what Kamada has said. We are appealing to private owner, to the state media. That one is required by law, by the constitution, to allow equal free access by all the candidates who are standing to inform the voters. But you know the tendency in the past has been to focus on state media. And yet today, state media is one uh, out of so many <laughs> media sure. platforms in this country. Mm. Actually, the private is dom dom dominant, mm. almost uh, overwhelming. So we are appealing to the proprietors, to the journalists in the private media uh, fraternity, please, it's very important, under the present circumstances of an electronic election, to allow free equal opportunities to all the candidates so that they can provide information. They can sell their programs to the electorate so that the electorate, when it comes to voting, they stop voting for 2,000 shillings because that's what has been happening. You know, you've seen it. Eh? Somebody, uh, people distributing money and they don't, they don't distribute much, eh? 2,000. Eh? 2,000 which cannot even buy uh, chicken, but somebody sells his or her vote for 2,000 shillings. But if the people are well informed and they know what their interests are, what their rights are, their interests in terms of development for their their own homes, families, for their own local communities, for their country, they will stop uh, being beguiled so easily like that and start voting for substance. So it's very important for private media media to
to assist the people of this country, the voters in this country, to have adequate access to information. Many thanks for that. Uh, gentlemen, let's take a quick break, uh, but uh, when we return, we'll be uh, delving into uh, some other uh, sticky situations when it comes to uh, this particular uh, role of uh, human rights, let alone the Uganda Human Rights Commission and the election that is uh, just a few months away. Let's take a quick break. We'll return with uh, more on the same. Every year on the second Saturday during the month of October, people from around the world who have been impacted by a life-limiting illness, either personally or by supporting a loved one, make their voices heard, asking policy makers to pay attention to prioritize palliative care policies and services. In Uganda, the Palliative Care Association of Uganda took center stage to raise awareness and understanding of the needs, medical, social, practical and spiritual, of people living with a life-limiting illness and their families in Uganda to raise funds to support and develop hospice and palliative care services in Uganda and to share the vision of increasing the availability of hospice and palliative care throughout Uganda by creating opportunities to speak out about the issue. The Palliative Care Association of Uganda, working together with the Ministry of Health and NTV, will host a high-level virtual discussion under the theme Palliative Care, It's My Care, My Comfort. This Saturday, 10th October, 2000. 2020. The event will be live online on NTV social media pages starting at 9.30 a.m. The panelists include Dr. Jackson Namoni, Commissioner Clinical Services, Ministry of Health, Dr. Henry Dungu, President and Board Chair, Palliative Care Association of Uganda, Dr. Emmanuel Luyirika, Executive Director, African Palliative Care Association, Martha Raboni, Health Service Coordinator, Mobile Hospice Marara. The chief guest is Dr. Jane Ruth Acheng. Minister of Health. Join the conversation on hashtag WHPCDay20UG at PCA Uganda on Twitter and Palliative Care Association of Uganda Facebook. Your Fridays shall never be the same again. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your girl, Itania, the life of the body. And my name is Doug and Ice. Now listen, man. Every single Friday, nobody brings the party like we do. That's why we are the MTV Mix Show. Featuring the one and only DJ Brian. Pam DJ, DJ Dash. On a disco way. From celebrating Raga Raga music to celebrating Ugandan music, hip hop and RB, we blow up issues like nobody does. Let's bounce. Wind the week down on the DJ Mix Show this Friday at 10 p.m., where the party never stops. Enoyemboze kuata kubachala. Abakunu kirizo bukadenga buna mu Uganda. Bakera nyo boli kumachia, okusinga abantu abalala bonna mu maka. Enko ke mbere beri eba tena koko kolima, ngo bvuna ni zibu, bwabazuku sizada, okuteke la teke la ba, agendo kukole chenchia, nga kuata dena basomi, wakati muthi yungu e chikute chizikiza. Ebisare ebimu, ebi yungu bivera munda, na ingo kusingi dadala, bivera bweiro. Ni wangu vadol na kurona lubera likiiza. Echisinga mubiona, yensonga yoku kumechoto kumachoku kufumbe chencha. Gazili sigiri zinta mezine zaburi jomu na puli la zinkesi. Zinyue ramanda, muka gunyoka, mwemanzi kumye. Nganaba zinza no kufu, nyinza no funa mwobu radi. Echote echirunji cheche echiko zesa amanda obe nkwentono. Chino chiko lewa, nga chisobolo kukume bugumu. Era chikusoboze sa okufumbo kumale chisere ichi wanfu. Kati nsobolo gula manda ganginga ganko minya. Neganko lila. Oluna kulona negafumba bulichie njagala. Kati nfisi za dala kasendi. Yali ya koze sa nusu kakaga. Oluna kukati nkoze sa liku minita.
24 minutes to uh, 5 p.m. Uh, welcome back. I'm Arnold Sagawa. You're still watching uh, this particular talk show as uh, we delve into uh, uh, human rights, all being cognizant of uh, the upcoming election just a few months away in uh, 2021. Joining me for this particular conversation are uh, two uh, uh, very erudite gentlemen. Um, just to my left, uh, Dr. Kateba Rirua Amoti, who is the acting chairperson of Uganda Human Rights Commission. And to my extreme left, uh, Bionabi uh, Kamadi, who is the director of research education and documentation at the Uganda Human Rights Commission. Gentlemen, uh, welcome back. Um, uh, let's uh, just uh, set off where we left off. The role of uh, the Uganda Human Rights Commission. Uh, let me start with you, uh, Doctor. Uh, Uganda Human Rights Commission, uh, usually we, uh, well, as the name suggests, a uh, very uh, 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 old institution has been around uh, for such a long time. But when it comes to this particular time, at this particular corner, uh, how would you explain it to an ordinary citizen? Where do you come into this particular picture? Yeah, that's uh, an important question. I remind you that Uganda Human Rights Commission is a constitutional body. It was set up under the Constitution, Article 50, 51. 51. Um, really meaning that it is was set up by the people of Uganda through their representatives who made the Constitution. And uh, the, uh, the role, the mandate of Uganda Human Rights Commission is to promote and protect human rights in this country. Always. But now, as you've said, during this particular uh, process of election, we tend to focus on the rights of the people, those who stand for elections, who candidates, and those who vote. But also other actors in the process. For example, you have got the security forces getting involved. The Electoral Commission getting involved. The other day we were we had a meeting with the Electoral Commission, the chairperson and the commissioners. He raised a very interesting issue. He said, "For us here, the staff of the of the Electoral Commission, we don't vote <laughs> on that day. We are overwhelmed by work. Yet they also have a right yes. to vote. So our our role as Uganda Human Rights Commission is to uh, make sure that rights." and freedoms and liberties are respected and promoted during the process of election. And how do we do this? One of the things that we do is monitoring the process of election. Last, the, the, the previous election of 2016, we deployed two, over 200 of our staff across the whole country. I think we, we were the biggest uh, monitors in, in, in that exercise. So we monitor the process of election right from the time when the electoral commission begins its work of drawing up the roadmap of, uh, uh, and, and publicizing the roadmap, now revising the roadmap. Then you have now the process of registration and uh, and uh, and displaying the registers and uh, voters uh, uh, checking the registers then you get into primary party primaries and so on and so forth right up to the end including after the vo the results of the general election have been announced oh. we continue the process of monitoring that is one of the things we do but as i have already uh, 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 indicated earlier on we also have the mandate of uh, educating the people through civic education and this does not takes place before the electoral process takes place but also during the electoral process and i've also talked about educating people about uh, the constitution and uh, their responsibilities and the duties as far as the constitution is concerned. That also continues during the process of election. We also have, when we are monitoring, it's very important for us to focus on how the government of Uganda is honoring its international and regional obligations. Because you, the government of Uganda has signed a number of international human rights uh, 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 yes, uh, 
not only international but regional at the African level, even regional at the East African uh, uh, regional level. So we monitor how uh, the, st the standards stated in those uh, 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 documents are complied with, particularly by government and its institutions. We also have another important role that we, we play. Uh, we receive uh, complaints on alleged human rights violations. That is also part of our mandate, the Constitution. We receive them, we investigate them thoroughly, and after investigations, we decide how we should handle them, either through mediation, between the, uh, the parties conflicting or encouraging the parties to agree to settle their differences amicably or we have a, a tribunal which has the powers of court. So where it is necessary, those complaints are taken to the tribunal which then will listen to both sides, the complaining side, the responding side, and then it will take decisions mm. and uh, I, I, for the purpose of remedy. Mm. So we have that duty also we come in. And during the election, you have a lot of complaints of human rights violations which come to our commission yes. through our regional offices and our field offices. Mm. Yeah. It's, uh, I think uh, because we happen to be in a newsroom, I'm speaking for myself here and my colleagues, uh, all this news uh, comes to you on a daily. And uh, I remember, I've just remembered when a, a doctor was uh, speaking, uh, an issue around uh, one uh, legal practitioner mentioning that if we were to have uh, this hybrid election, which is uh, uh, premised on a scientific campaign, then there would be need to have an amendment or a provision in the Constitution. I'm remembering this because uh, it's not very often that I sit down with the uh, two legal scholars. Um, I think, uh, Kamadi, you could uh, touch that for me, uh, whether or not for this to actually work out and have a credible election, at least as seen uh, across the world in our uh, international partners, would there then need to be a, a little provision that is added to the Constitution for this to go forward or it's not necessary? Then segue that for me into the role of citizens uh, in uh, the electoral process, besides voting, of course. Uh, thank you very much. What I have noticed that uh, elections as a subject is an emotive matter. Mm. Therefore, it requires a lot of soberness. <laughs> it requires people to be informed. And you just don't uh, approach an issue for the sake of it. It doesn't call for the amendment of the Constitution to, 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 to organize this election, not at all. I think I would like to urge the all actors in the political processes, in the general elections, first of all, to acquaint themselves with the provisions of the Constitution and the enabling laws, Presidential Elections Act, the Electoral Commission Act, Local. the pa Parliamentary Elections Act. For instance, the other day, I was seeing some people, with due respect, you would expect to know better, k blaming the Electoral Commission for not uh, stating the polling day. Yet the presidential, both presidential and parliamentary elections act are very clear. N polling day is gazetted after nominations. Now, if the EC has not yet nominated, members of parliament and presidential candidates why do you blame it for not telling you when polling day is uh, uh, as as journalists we ought to report what these players say so uh, please we, but, we try uh, to be sober we i think i think it's important to contextualize the discussion mm -hmm. uh, uh, and because when we simply say things for the sake of saying them we misinform mm -hmm. we mislead and this is sometimes the cause of violence some group of people will say the Electoral Commission is hiding something. Yet the, uh, the, the electoral laws are very clear. Yeah. You cannot set a nomination, a polling day before a nomination. Yeah. So similarly, this 
so-called hybrid election. Nobody invited the corona in the world. It, uh, if it was only in Uganda, but still, even if we, it, it, sometimes we have had the, our own challenges here of the Ebola mm. and the cholera, and we understand. So if it is a disease, it's a disease. The most important thing is for the players to ensure that there is equal space. Because COVID is not affecting one candidate and sparing another. So the moment the ground is leveled, let us all participate in the prevailing circumstances. And then whatever we come out with is that. Yeah. So um, the role of citizens, very, very important. You see, in the protection of human rights, we have what we call the duty bearers and the rights holders. Yes, it is the primary responsibility of the state to protect and promote human rights. But the state is you and me. You know, we are the people. Therefore, uh, we should not all the time heap blame, expectations on uh, the state, the electoral commission, the police, government, and ETC. We as citizens, we have a role. For instance, let us use the just concluded NRM primaries as a case in point. The Electoral Commission is on record. Minister of Health is on record. Even the Secretary General of the NRM is on record saying, observe SOPs. Maintain social distance, wash your hands, wear masks. But what do we see? You see people running up running in groups in a total disregard of this important message. Mm. Now, what, what is the role of you flouting the SOPs and you contract COVID because you are happy and running up and down to vote somebody whose services you are not going to enjoy? Uh, to enjoy? So see, eh, 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 I want to urge Ugandans uh, that Article 17 of the Constitution is very clear on the duties of the citizen. The duties are very many. I cannot uh, uh, mention them here. But one of them which is very critical in electoral processes is cooperating with law enforcement agencies. Because there is a lot of fighting between citizens and the police. Sometimes it is the police that uh, tends to flout some procedures, but sometimes it is the citizens. Because why should you pelt the police with stones? They have a duty to protect uh, life and property. So as a citizen, if you are dissatisfied with what is happening, there are recourse mechanisms through a civil way, petition courts of law instead of fighting with the police on, uh, uh, in the field. This is a very big problem that uh, Ugandans need to uh, consider, and even the political actors to help out, because the, the election is not, a, a conducting an election is not a mandate of the Electoral Commission, uh, is not a role of the Electoral Commission alone. They are actors, other actors. You, the media, the media should also uh, work towards ensuring that we avoid violence and chaotic scenes. So citizens have a duty to, re to respect, to cooperate with the police uh, during law enforcement. Very, very important. But also, the citizens also uh, have a duty, for instance, to register. We are talking at a time when the cut-off point is over by the Electoral Commission, but it is important for citizens to know, because we are going to see complaints of people saying, mm -hmm. I've not, my name is not in the voters' register. Mm -hmm. But did you register? Your name does not find itself there if you skipped an important electoral registration process. We've just seen one of the candidates for the uh, uh, mayor race here in Kampala being turned away by the Electoral Commission. And now, that is an aspiring leader. He's not on the National Voters Register. Yep. There are quite many who turn up on polling day, and then they 
try to cause commotion and confusion. So citizens should know that if you did not bother or for one reason or the other you were unable to register, wait for the next election because uh, preferential treatment is not going to be given because there was a cutoff. So it is important to know that you have a duty to register for elections and other lawful purposes mm. like uh, the, the national voter uh, registration exercises. So uh, citizens should know that they are not supposed to be compelled. They are supposed to participate in these exercises. Very, very important. I think the issue of violence is very important for us to stress. The uh, citizens, the voters, know they have a duty to uh, prevent violence during the process of uh, electro the electoral process. We should have a peaceful, fair, and credible electoral process throughout, from pr party primaries through the general election next year. It's very important also the citizens to know they have a duty and responsibility to avoid bribery during this process of election. You, you know, commercialization of, of, of the election exercise now. Eh? We, the people should know that they have a duty and responsibility to avoid using uh, hate speech, language that if, 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 uh, 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 you know, hurts the, the, the rights of other people. I, I hear you there, Doctor, but my problem is uh, at times uh, even the electorate, I'm trying to think on their side, or I'm also part of it, uh, uh, the leaders themselves set such a terrible example. I mean, the exactly. other day we saw one uh, uh, as a particular state minister, yes. uh, uh, you know, but caught on camera allegedly pulling a, a gun from someone and uh, making all these threats and uh, that for me leaves such if you are a leader quote unquote uh, uh, and he's also a legal practitioner it just leaves me baffled and uh, at an utter loss for words and it leaves someone wondering if the so-called leader can do that you know uh, what kind of example are you setting for an 18 year old who is going to go to the ballot box for the first time i will not discuss specifically that issue of the leader whom you have quoted because the matter is in court mm -hmm. as far as our, con our com commission is concerned even me as an individual when a matter is in a court it is sub judice to discuss it okay, okay but let us talk generally what you have said because you are right political leaders, party political leaders should set the right example to the citizens, to the electorate, to behave in a manner that is responsible, mm. respectful of p other people's rights, and uh, carrying out their personal, their individual duties to the constitution. They should set the right example. But many times we are getting across the political parties, bad examples being set by the leaders. I agree with you. Definitely. Mm. Uh, gentlemen, we're actually uh, running out of time. Uh, very briefly, maybe the two of you could touch on the issues of uh, the common human rights violations. Uh, very interesting impersonation coming up very often. Uh, multiple voting. Uh, maybe in just a minute with the uh, two of you, because uh, we're actually running out of time. I'll start with you, Mr. Commander. Uh, thank you very much. In all these electoral processes, a number of human rights uh, violations do occur. Mm. One of them is torture. A number of both voters and the contestants alike, they end up being tortured. So um, the message you would like to send across is an election should not be looked at as a matter of life and death. Certainly there will be a winner. Yeah. With our winner, take it all, there must be a winner. So uh, let us avoid uh, aspects that lead to torture. Yeah. And, and cruel and uh, cruel and inhuman, all those things. Uh, all those things. Yeah. And the police here should also take note because they are also very much involved in this in terms of the complaints we get. Yeah. Personal liberty. There are some candidates who are arrested and detained illegally for a number of uh, days 
Sometimes, Plus all, the 48 hours. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes there are funny aspects involving some invisible hands so as to disadvantage another candidate. By the time he or she is released, he has lost enough time to campaign mm -hmm. or should waste a lot of time by frequenting court. That affects the free will of the people. It affects the, uh, the freeness and fairness of the election. So uh, personal liberty is also uh, use, uh, highly uh, uh, violated during electoral process. But also right to life. Some people are actually arbitrarily short, you know, hmm. and they die there and then because of an election. There are issues to do with freedom of expression. Yeah. Because the right to vote cannot be achieved without the other facilitating rights. Freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of association. All those are rights that find themselves violated during electoral processes. Right. I think okay. it's also important to add that uh, all the people of 18 years or above uh, who have registered to vote should be enabled to vote. And this includes that there should be no discrimination yeah. at all of any kind, including discrimination against people who, categories of people who tend to be vulnerable, women, people with disabilities, man, minorities, and so on. Everybody of 18 years and above who has registered everything possible should be done to enable them to vote. Doctor, uh, definitely uh, with that final word, many thanks indeed. Uh, I'm afraid that's all the time that uh, we did have lots to actually delve into, but uh, the conversation will be continuing on this uh, particular theme, of course, uh, in uh, concert with the Uganda Human Rights Commission. Uh, many thanks to the panelists today. To my left, uh, Dr. Katebari Rwa Amorti, who is the acting chairperson of the Uganda Human Rights Commission, and uh, to my extreme left, uh, Mr. Bionabie uh, Kamadi, who is the director of research, education, and documentation at the Uganda Human Rights Commission. That's where we leave it for this particular edition. I, we will be back uh, on Monday with uh, uh, yet another theme on the same. Uh, lots of uh, legal jargon. You need to uh, definitely get out your constitution on that particular day. Uh, that sums it up for today. I'm Arnold Sagawa. Thanks for watching. shall never be the same again. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your girl, Itania, the life of the party. And my name is Doug and Ice. Now listen, man, every single Friday, nobody brings the party like we do. That's why we are the MTV Mix Show, featuring the one and only DJ Brian. Pam DJ, DJ Dash, on a disco way. From celebrating reggae rather music to celebrating Ugandan music, hip hop and R&B, we blow up issues like nobody does. Let's bounce. Wind the week down on the DJ Mix Show this Friday at 10 p.m. Where the party never stops. NTV, turning on your world. Slide your way and tame your thirst with a new Reham Cola. You can sense taste and when you choose the best, regardless of the party,